Oof. Oh, serious. Wow. Man. How's it going, everybody? Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever time you're watching this. As always, thanks for watching Common Sense Fishing. I've got a good video for you guys tonight. Super excited. I've been wanting to plan something really in depth and break down. Um, and tonight, we're going to be breaking down some of my favorite lures. We're going to be showing you differences between a KVD square bill, an Ish Monroe square bill, a Norman, you know, the different depths, but the different uh, wobbles and body types of Rapala, balsa wood. So we're going to actually get in depth and I'm going to break down what I do know. Um, as I try to avoid acting like a professional or a guide or giving too much in depth tips because sometimes could be wrong, but I'm, I think it's a, uh, you know, about time I'm going to share with you guys some of my best secrets. So, hope you guys enjoyed tonight's show. Smash that like button. Make sure you share the video. Let other people know, hey, cool YouTuber out there giving away information and helping out the community. And uh, always remember, a comment and a like goes a long way. So, thank you very much. And uh, give you guys a little sneak peek of what we're going to talk about tonight. Get into smashing a beer real quick. And... Uh, then we'll start getting into the lures. Any questions or comments, as always, just leave them below, and uh, we'll get into it. So we're going to have some drop shot tips and tricks. I'm going to show you guys some of my most deadly drop shot stuff. We're going to talk top water that nobody ever throws, and by that I mean soft plastic top water. Most people throwing top water are throwing frogs. They're throwing whopper ploppers or they're throwing like spooks and stuff like that. Walking baits, wake baits. I want to talk about soft plastic. This is a frog kit, but I'm going to be bringing up particularly the Rage Shad and the Rage Frog, as well as the Bass Pro Shops versions and a couple of other soft plastics and some ways to use them that you may have never thought possible couple of different uh, examples of how they can be used so versatile and a lot of guys don't throw them so a little secret I haven't shown anybody on really any of my videos shout out to Bash Fell Jeremy for putting me on this technique many 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 years ago <clears throat> so we're gonna break down square bills like I said we're gonna go in depth on a, a, a strike King a biggie Papa a Rapala medium diving which is all well, all square bills are, but then we're going to get into, you know, a shallow. We're going to get into then like an actual medium diver, 8 to 12 feet, deep divers, stuff like that, coffin bills. We're going to talk about what the bills are for, what they do. What's up? Nice to see you on tonight. Thanks for commenting. Smash that like if you guys get a chance. And feel free to interrupt me, to chat, to throw out anything you guys want. But in the meantime, I'm just going to get excited and talk fishing. So we got a bunch of uh, different boxes of lures out. So we're going to get into square bills and crankbaits. And I'm specifically trying to bring out some fall and summer lures for you guys. There's some other ones that I'm just not going to cover right now, but I'm covering most of my favorites. And we're going to talk about the juice on how to use them. Then we've got the good old-fashioned Cinco's. We're going to talk about those. Wacky rig, Texas rig, drop shot, drop shot, wacky, Nico. You know, we're going to get down with the Cinco. We're going to hook you guys up tonight. Again, another box of square bills. They're just that important. <clears throat> we're going to talk jerk baits real quick, too. We're going to go over those. That's coming up. Winter time is going to be, and fall is really good jerk bait time. Talk about when to use a sinking jerk bait, a, a suspending jerk bait, and a floating jerk bait. We're going to talk about the different body types. I've got a couple spy baits in here. I'm, I'm not no spy bait pro. I don't think I've ever actually thrown one. So I can't wait to try to put some fish on that bait in this year. But I would assume it's just like the, the jerk bait. But I'm not going to go into any tips with that because I don't have much. Uh... Hey, happy Wednesday. Happy hump day, Mike Dozer. Nice to see you on the screen tonight. We're going to be covering one of my favorites, spinner baits. Got a box full of spinner baits here. Then we're going to break down some different hooks and weights and different uh, uh, setups basically talk about why I use what on what we're actually gonna break this stuff down for you guys tonight so if it helps you know smash that like button 
And then one other subject we're going to talk about is glass rods and crankbaits because we're going we're to be covering those. Are they important? Do they really make that much of a difference? And uh, we got one right here. This is uh, the E6X G Loomis, and it's specifically for small, medium diving crankbaits and uh, shallow crankbaits like square bills on the 1 to 2.5 range, you know. This is not for big deep divers. This is not a big bait rod right here, this particular one. So this is a glass G Loomis. And uh, right now I've got the Revo Beast on it. Um, I believe this is a, a slower speed compared to my other, my Corrados and uh, the 8 to 1s and stuff. So on the square bill, I like to have a slower Real, but I don't remember. I think the Revo Beast has a higher speed too. I actually may need to switch this reel out. But uh, it's been working pretty good for me. If I need to slow roll it, I could just slow down. Um, but if I need to speed up, I got the speed that I need. Um, if I remember correctly, I think this is a 651 or is it a 551? Five, five, Something I have to check it out. But uh, crankbaits. I mean, even look. Let's look on the. Let's look at which one this one is. I don't know if this one said it. I know it does on the box. Yeah, 641. Yeah. So this one's, you know, it, it's got a good range of speeds for me. It's not too fast. It's not too slow. It's got some power. Uh, I don't like cinching the drag down all the way with crankbaits, with the, uh, with the treble hooks. You're going to lose a lot of fish if you're, if you're, you're too heavy on the, if your rod's too heavy, if your line's too heavy, if your drag ain't set right, you can't horse a fish in um, with this particular setup. I mean, you can control them slightly and do a good job with them, but uh, problem with these are is even if, let's say, you have the right rod and line and reel, these hooks will snap or bend out. If you, I've caught... Um, one double digit but a bunch of eight and nines on something exactly like this and as soon as you get into the seven eight pound range when a, especially at the delta when a bass smashes your crankbait and you hook into them um one of two things is been genuinely bound to happen if your drag is not set enough and it pulls hard enough it will snap and if your line is not is is strong enough you're using braid or say you know 20 pound or something then your hooks will either do one of two things they'll either snap or they'll straighten you're not going to land that fish um you need to give them some play and fight now if you upgrade to really big strong hooks it messes with the action they get snagged more i've tried upgrading and replacing these hooks so there's a balance you have to play with here and like I said, I've caught many of eight pounders. I've caught a couple nines, but I've got a double digit for sure on this exact setup. Actually, two double digits. In a similar setup, I got a double digit on the on the square bill, and then on this exact setup, I got a double digit on a medium diving crankbait. So, yes, quality matters. And and if you're crankbaiting, if you like the crankbait, I strongly recommend a glass rod. Um, G. Loomis, St. Croix, or whatever, however you pronounce them. Um, you know, the two, two best glass rods that I know of that are decently priced. Um, so they're very important in my opinion, because I've caught a lot of fish with this that I just did not barely feel the bite, uh, where the fish either A, must have been matching my reeling speed, you know, and hit it either coming in, um, you know, to where it, I'm not even feeling anything, but those glass rods are so sensitive that uh, it's it's just, I could imagine, I'm pretty sure they make them for like drop shot and another stuff too, but these things are just so sensitive that I couldn't imagine, and they're very light too, uh, I could imagine them being very, very powerful tools. So this is my first one. I hope to get many more. I've got carbon lights. I've got, you know, a bunch of other stuff, but uh, this is my first true really nice glass rod. So I just want to start off with that. If you're a big crankbaiter, if you throw square bills like me, if you love covering water, 
and throwing the square bill at like the delta or even these lakes man people be tripping thinking that like there's not much you know and there isn't but that square bill gets seen for days and it's like a retard do, 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 bouncing into stuff and just it draws fish to it or if there's a fish near it they they just seem to just hate the square bill and they go after it with a passion and i've caught so many fish too that i've watched the fish come up go to eat it and i never even seen the fish put the lure in the mouth but the back hook the back hooks just one single hook barely gets the fish and i play it really good and land you know i've caught a five pounder like that on video with one hook through its lip barely and i watched the sucker bite right by the boat and basically it came up and it, and it attacked at the lure like snipped at it and went to dart a, away and i never seen the lure in its mouth and it sure enough though it won't like oh got it so <clears throat> those treble hooks save the day sometimes so when you get short strikes on like a spinner bait or a kai tech or a cinco that square bill does not have any mercy. It gets those fish pretty much every time. If they attack it from the head, they're done for sure. If they attack it from behind, which is the way most fish get it, they're going to definitely almost always get a hook. <clears throat> so what colors are good? For square bills, we're going to get into that. So right now, so I, I was going to, that's going to be one of the, the tips. We're going to talk about that. So we'll just cross that bridge now, I guess. So I'm a big fan in throwing crawdad colors for most of the spring. Pre-spawn and early spawn, I go crawdad colors on my crankbaits. Delta craw or cold-blooded if you're using the Ish Monroe. We'll show you two of those here in a minute. Then once the bass have spawned, I like to then go to, or right as they're spawning at the in the middle and towards the end, I like to switch from a craw color to a bluegill or sunfish perch color and uh because the bass just particularly hate them and they also eat them up to a certain size um one thing to think of is that when a fish has fins on its back that are spiky and hard a bass can only eat up to a certain size one so you know it, they have a hard time eating really big ones sometimes they'll try um to their detriment but if the fish is like a trout or smooth man they can take some really big fish and they can eat them still so <clears throat> but they hate bluegill and if that's like this 2.0 or 2.5 so this is a norman this is a norman deep diving crankbait i want to say this is going to go about like 12 to 16 feet fire tiger really really great lure right there um <clears throat> but you know that that size right there is just perfect bass candy just just monsters unload on it everybody knows if you want to catch a biggest bass right throw a live bluegill that's how you catch mondo stripers and mondo bass well i mean a square bill let's break one out is basically just like a perfect nice snack size little bluegill i mean look at them all right they're just, they're fat little things, right? And you, they're not as big as you think. So people that like like to throw worms, this sucker is only that big. It's like a Ned rig that swims around. So it's not very intimidating to throw like a giant swim bait. But yeah, it, it will it will trigger monsters. I've caught monsters on a square bill. Lots of monsters. So getting back to color. Um I like to use a craw color in the early spring, late winter, early spring, up until certain time of spawn. Then it goes to a bluegill perch color, right? And as soon as the baby, ba the bluegills have spawned and now the bluegills have backed off and uh, there's a bunch of baby bluegill that are just microscopically small, right? Then now the baby bass are starting to get, you know, two, three, two inches, inch and a half. That's when I start going from a red color to now a white and chartreuse, a white and blue if I'm in clear water like McClure or Pedro and it's not dirty and there's not a bunch of pleasure boaters turning the water brown. It's like one of those clear days where, where you're in an arm or an area where there's not a lot of boating activity and uh, the water's very clear, which that can happen in a lot of these lakes even on hot days. 
so it just depends on the the year right so <clears throat> but uh then i'd probably use more of the white and blue white and black um and, and just because what i'm trying to replicate is a bait fish at that point now not necessarily a bluegill in particular or a crawdad in particular because now from the summer months and all the way into early fall the water will be filled with just billions and millions of trillions of bait fish of various sizes and types you know you might even have baby catfish swimming around at a certain point you're going to have baby carp swimming around at a certain point baby bass swimming around you're gonna have baby bluegill and then regular bluegill are big enough to eat to a certain size too baby shad shad if they're still alive usually that in the summer but certain times of the year you'll still have them right up until certain temperatures they'll be in certain areas especially in the very early morning so there's just so much fish going on during certain times of the year especially the latter half because uh, and then you know the the lake starts to cool down or the body of water starts to cool down when the nights start getting cold the fish start moving at different and activating the uh, bait fish starts coming up the ones that were hiding deep down down deep as the top of the lake starts becoming now cooler than the bottom uh, because uh, you know when the lake starts turning over when the night gets cold it's not yet but these fish like i said as soon as the night gets cold that's like the signal to the fish that summer's over basically even though we may be still be getting 100 degree days or 90 degree days here and there we're also going to get 80 degree days and then lows in the 50s 60s and these fish feel that and remember to me also boyle's law or charles law i forget which one pressure and temperature correlate so if you have a low temperature, you have a low pressure. You know the old saying about the raising and lowering of the barometric pressure. You know the old school guys that want it at a certain pressure level. So <clears throat> you know what I mean? There's magic that happens when 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 these ends are changing anyways, especially for winter. The bass are stocking up. So anyways, it ain't winter yet, but my point is, is late summer and into early fall, I'm going for more of a white color, uh, more of a shiny, more of a bait fish. Try to kind of catch them all, fool them all, or I might throw baby bass. So those are my two favorites. Baby bass because the bass spawn first, and so the baby bass will be bigger than the baby bluegill and baby whatever have you. And those baby bass will provide more sustenance at a certain stage. Because what will happen is when the bass are spawning, they the males... When they stop guarding the fry, they will turn on the fry and eat them, right? And these fry are super tiny. And these males that are one to two pounds can actually get some food off of a cloud of fry chasing it around, eating them all day, right? And uh, once those fry, the, the schools will coalesce too. You get big groups of fries. They'll get whittled down, but they, big, they, they keep joining together, right? Um, like the T-1000. And there'll be massive schools of them in certain areas, especially once they get big enough. Once they get big enough, those bass hone in on those baby bass like big time. And, and they're just like a uh, bluegill, nice, big, fat, meaty treat. The bass are young and stupid. So they, they have, if you eat, instead of eating 500 of them, you know, now a five pounder could just eat 10 of them, like goldfish, right? So, um, baby bass and minnows are big color for this time now once the those minnows and those baby bass and baby blue all that good stuff start dying off and getting ate up more and more and more then i start reverting back to like delta craw cold-blooded i like to throw jigs and then i'll go also with the silver and black or silver and blue because then if I'm trying to imitate bait fish, I want to go for like shad or, or something like that's in the body of water that's got maybe a bigger profile so you can draw a bigger fish. Those are my kind of uh, logic to it. But um, that's if I'm for my power and my reaction. If I'm bottom bouncing like a drop shot or something, I'll cycle through a few different colors and I'll usually pick them based on water clarity. If water clarity is okay, I'm going with morning dawn, margarita mutilator, 
Aaron's Magic, stuff like that, right? I think Aaron's Magic's more of the dirty water one, right? The purple and brown. And then bold bluegill, brown and green and purple or something like that. And uh, the pink and purple colored ones are the ones I almost exclusively use. Margarita Mutilator, Morning Dawn. Uh, there's another one. I'm, thinking, I'm just spacing it right now. But anyways, those are my go-tos. And then I have a I have a little hidden drop shot stuff I'm going to show you guys that I don't told anybody about. And there's two specific colors we're going to get into there. Yep. See, like matching the hatch, trying to ignite a reaction strike. When we were at the Delta, we went at nighttime. The waters were boiling with bait fish all around us. It was so crazy. It was just like, sounded like it was raining. And fish were just, little fish were jumping. And you could hear poof, poof, little just fish eating them. But the majority of them were smaller fish. But there was some nice fish mixed in. Like keeping it real, got himself like a five to seven pound or so. Something like that, maybe a seven pound striper. Something pretty nice. So it was pretty good. We had fun, went out at the Delta, and like I said, it was just it was just crazy. There were so many bait fish, but all right. Smash that like. Most guys would throw something like this. This is one of my favorite little get ups right here. I tell you what. So I'll take these. Let me get one right here. <laughs> and you do. I'll get my A rig off right real quick. Man. Here we go. So, all right. This is some of my. How's it going? Cheers, brother. This is honestly some of my best tips and tricks tonight that I'm giving out. I'm going to try to give you guys. I don't act like I know like a lot or I'm the best fisherman ever, but I really want to try to give you guys some of maybe it may be known, may not be known, but some of my best tips and tricks that have caught me the biggest fish or the numbers per se. But uh, tonight I'm actually trying to break things down in a very concise manner or and also just in depth, and I'm going to cover each lure that I'm throwing. So we're, we're going to talk about a couple of different lures tonight, and we're going to break them down really good. So thanks for commenting. Thanks for watching. And uh, don't forget to smash that like button. All right, guys and gals. So how many of you guys, first of all, have ever had a spinner bait where you lose the skirt, right? The stupid skirt falls to pieces excuse me because the rubber band right the little rubber piece here so now you got to go buy a new rubber piece and put it all back together not me i'm lazy i just throw stuff away so long time ago i i started doing this as a kid and i realized it worked and i've done it ever since and uh basically I've done it first with worms, believe it or not, curly tail worms. And then I started getting wise and using stuff like this. But there we go. All right. So now I would take this out there and throw it like a Kitek, but it's got a 3 8 ounce head. And this particular bad boy is a tandem it's a colorado double colorado or sorry colorado with the mini and this one is an indiana blade which is actually one of my favorites you notice that it's not super round um, but it's like tear dropped that's a cross between a willow and the colorado so this is a colorado big fat round colorado blade this one's just a little bit slight longer. It's called an Indiana blade. Or at least that's what I've always been taught. So one of my favorites right here, this will uh, ride higher in the water column the faster you reel it. So the slower you reel it, the lower it goes. The faster you reel it, the higher it pulls up.
Now, another tip is when you run a spinnerbait, remember because of the way that this uh, works and like drag in the water, it will always uh, roll this way with the blades up. A spinnerbait should never come in like this, all right? A spinnerbait will always come in like this because of the water dynamics, because these will catch the water while this will swim through it. And these cause, these have more like uh, friction and more uh, disturbance, more surface area, like big fins and paddles that kick, right? So this is what keeps the spinnerbait facing this way. So make sure that uh, you put your, your tail on like this. Or do I have it backwards? No, yeah, I have it right. It's like this. So, <clears throat> Kitex. Uh, I'll always throw a Kitex on the back of this. You can throw a bigger one. You can throw a smaller one. I don't like to have much of my Kitex past the hook, so I prefer a smaller Kitex. And this would be the candy just using the regular old Kitex. Kitex. But this bait right here is bigger than these two blades. These blades cause the float that you need and a lot of vibration, while well, this is what gets bit. And again, the faster you reel it, the higher up it ro rolls. The slower you reel it, the lower it rolls. This is a great weapon to slow roll right now, and you can fish this in many different depth, uh, many different situations, in weeds at the Delta, at, at McClure. So that shad color is my favorite. Heck yeah, Cali Berry. I love this shad color right here, too. So that's what I was saying. I go to like silvers and grays, silvers and blacks, you know, silvers and dark colors, like silvers and blues, blacks and grays. And then I like, uh, you know, that's what I, I like basically for the late summer and into the winter, all into the winter. I like to stay with white colors, silver colors, uh, shad colors, sexy shad all kinds of different colors like that for this time of the year. But also I'll start to throw the Delta Craw and uh, Cold-Blooded as well. Now that's where the uh, the bluegill colors and stuff like that are usually getting put away right now for me. Um, I'd be shifting to those gears right there. So spinner baits, I'm sure everybody knows this. But uh, just going to throw it out there just to make the tips and tricks complete, you know. <clears throat> Heck, yeah. Gold blades are my favorite. Yep, gold blades. You'll see I have a lot of gold blades. Let me pull one out. It's hard to see. All right. See it in the corner down here? My spinner blades are tangled. I have a lot of gold blade ones. Those are my favorite ones to throw. Um, here's another one right here. It, it creates more of a drawing attractant, I think, than a silver blade. And uh, also, see, this is my favorite right here. This is an old favorite. I've caught multiple six pluses. So that's a true Colorado blade on the bottom. You see that? So this is a double Colorado right here. And uh, this is an old Booyah, double Colorado. This baby right here, and then you see the difference? This is a perfect example between a Colorado and a uh, Indiana. So do you guys see the difference? So the Colorado is just pure. Let's hold them still if we can. Sorry, guys, guys and gals. Let's just, uh, okay, do you see that? Colorado. Indiana. I love the Indiana. I love it, but a good old double bladed Colorado. This bad boy. Oh, Ninja Warrior right here. I see everybody throwing their Dinkle Hop and Willow Blades out there. I'm just secretly laughing inside. Like, ha, Willow Blades. Lame. Nah, not really. I just, they each got their own purpose, right? I'm not a big Willow Blade fan. Willow Blades to me, or when you want to get the spinnerbait deeper, when you're less compare, uh, concerned with flash and uh, commotion kick, and you are with, like, let's say, making a, a bait a school of bait fish. So this would more imitate baby bluegills, right? Baby bluegills. This more imitate baby shad. 
well not this one this one's red and black but you get what i'm saying like a silver one like this like that's going to represent a baby shad well that's more of like a bluegill this is trying to have the best of both worlds also gives it a little vibration right but uh the the blades believe it or not they actually are meant to to mimic a certain bait fish so a rounder blade is a rounder shorter squatter bait fish like a bluegill while a long skinny blade is more of a shad so if you're trying to mimic a, a school shad a a willow blade actually can be very devastating um and then sometimes a, just a, a a colorado just almost no matter how slow you reel it it just wants to lift up and and roll really high through the water column so you got to get a real heavy one if you want to get a big double or a single blade or a big double bladed colorado down like this usually you're going to want like a three quarter ounce or at least a half ounce even an ounce so these little you know this one i think is three quarter or at least it's a half i know that you can see a big difference between these two heads right so let's put them next to each other boom this one's definitely heavier <clears throat> but they probably ride similarly at the same speeds because one's a colorado double colorado and one's a uh an indiana so it's gonna the the bigger the blade the more lifting power it's gonna have basically so the higher your spinner bait's gonna roll um chatter baits right bladed jigs look at this that i have for a trailer here that is a piece of the mighty bug one of the best lures ever made the mighty bug i swear to you right now man the mighty bug is killer another little secret tactic of mine i haven't cut the weed guards yet off but sometimes i'll buy them you know the denny brower but the rattling jig a good old rattle you know make sure your jig has a little rattle on it All right um this crawdad's got this jig's profile is pretty big and it could be easily short you know I, I would i would cut this back a little bit but like i like this color scheme a uh rattling jig you know just super killer you can see i have uh some swim jigs over here too but <clears throat> oh look at that my skirt came right off these are so old this one hasn't, this box hasn't been messed with that much. As you can see, I've been neglecting my spinner baits, and that's going to stop because I've been using them a little bit more lately, and I've been doing a really good job. So rattling jigs, really awesome lure there. <clears throat> Sound was coming from the cam. That's what I thought. So this thing right here might not be even it might be take it's supposed to be taking the sound from supposed to be taking the sound from this and the audio or the video from that but uh, we'll have to play with that thanks for catching that there rc creative so <clears throat> all right spinner baits don't sleep on them and know the difference colorado indiana and willow and then you've got you know doubles triples you got all kinds of different ones tandem i think which is like a mix of the two like i don't even know but the point is know that there's like the terminology just know that there's uh different ones and what they're what they're used for just know the bigger the blade the more lift it's going to have so if you want to get deep you're going to either need a heavier spinner bait you have to slow you have to reel it slower um yeah i'm telling you colorado spinner baits are the way to go but also in indiana so uh, dirty water you want to use the colorado indiana clear water you want to use the willow if you're trying to imitate shad then a willow is great if you're trying to imitate um so if you're trying to imitate shad willow is good if you're trying to imitate uh bluegill or thicker bait fish then a colorado or indiana is good because also remember that the blade represents um it's kind of like a little a rig so you got these two blades and then you've got the skirt and the bait and the skirt and the bait are like you know if you have a trailer the skirt and the hook you know are 
poof well you got these smaller uh spinning um you know blades that are in front of it and so this all together is like a little bait ball and that's why a willow blade is kind of like representing a bait ball of small like uh, small bait type of fish that are like shad long fish right while the colorado is more of a short squat fatter fish so it's like a bluegill. So I, I handily believe that you will catch also bigger fish with a Colorado or a Indiana. That's my solid belief. Might be wrong, but that's my, my belief. So, again, doesn't make it right. It just, you know what I mean? It's uh, my, my little take on it. So uh, how are you guys doing tonight, though? You guys having good? You guys enjoying the show tonight? Smash that like button. Thanks for watching. Don't forget all the members. I've got a nice Christmas present for you guys. So we're going to have our members giveaway here in a couple weeks in September. We're going to have our uh, October and our November one. But come December, everybody's going to win. So super excited. I got something to share with you guys. So as you guys can see here, look, I did another, another toy drive haul. So um, I've also got word that somebody bought $500 worth of uh, – somebody got $500 worth of toys they're going to donate. So super cool. Um, that would be nice. I'm going to answer. We got shiced – what you call that? That's a uh, uh, double Colorado right there. Or you might have – um tandem that might be an indiana and a colorado it's hard to look in the picture because you can get custom blades too but they come in those general types indiana colorado and uh and um you know what i mean um willow <laughs> burnout uh, going to Delta tomorrow. Good luck, brother. I am going to the Bay Area tomorrow. I'm going to be doing two jobs out in uh, Sacramento and Roseville, actually. So not the Bay Area. I'll be up in Northern California. And then um, Friday, I'll be at the Delta with uh, Virgil. We'll see old Vince. We're going to become Vince and Steve. That's a little inside joke. His name's Virgil, and I, we call, I call him Vince. And he'll even call, refers to himself as Vince. We get all in this, like, third person. We get into, like, character mode where he becomes Vince and I become Steve. And we yell at each other, like, in joking ways. Like, we talk shit and just have hella fun. Like, hey, bum, what are you, you're, you're just trying to catch little ones, are you? I'll stop picking on the babies, Vince. Oh, shut up, Scuba Steve. <laughs> so, anyways, we have a good time. So, we're going to be at, like, the Rusty Port hole or uh, somewhere over there for lunch we'll be launching out of like where the sugar barge is at so we'll be fishing in that area i think this friday so uh got another cool video coming for sure we'll put that out soon tomorrow got another video coming for you guys so if the members if you guys have seen it already you know i give you guys early access to it hope you guys enjoyed it um otherwise it's gonna hit the main channel so we caught, we caught some fish, had fun. Hilf, Noah, and I, Aaron, we went out there and smashed them. So had a good time. But uh, let me know how you guys are enjoying tonight's show. If you guys have any questions or any specific stuff you want me to stop, go back on, anything I might have missed or didn't cover, um, feel free to. And then I don't get uh, with a tip, though. Oh, oh, like almost like that, that – uh, that uh, blade had like a little nip tip on it or something. I've seen those like custom blades, but I believe they're still either Colorado or Indiana. <clears throat> you are headed. I am heading to your side of town tomorrow. Yep, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to go do some work up in uh, Roseville and up in Sacramento on two uh, air conditioning units out there. I got to go handle some business and go do some things. So. Um, all right, I'm going to get back into some tips and tricks for you guys. We're going to bust out a couple square bills. And again, feel free to comment, you guys, and 
whatever you guys want to say, if there's anything you guys want to cover or want to know about or any uh, input you guys have, I appreciate the comments and the interaction. Hopefully, uh, YouTube will help the channel grow eventually. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we've got those two out. We've got these two. I'm going to pull this guy out. And then I want to find one more. Bear with me, guys. I want one more crankbait. Okay. Need one more, and we're good to go. We've got some crankbaits out, and we need to discuss type of crankbait. Peep that rig. Looks like a sleeper. Oh, yeah. Damn, we got to cover this type. We would be doing a disservice if we didn't cover this type. Oh, and this type. Dang it. I'm getting excited here. Ah, and I'm hooking myself. I turned into Pee Wee Herman there. Did you guys hear it? Ah, <laughs> Looks like I hooked myself. <laughs> All right. No double chin. Oh. What the hellfire? <laughs> so, this thing is super entangulated. Can I find another lure like it? Goodness, most graciousness. <laughs> Let me see here. Oh, you bugger. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. I got to get this super. T this lure is ultra tangled. Oh, there it goes. I got it. Yeah, yeah. That's also a sleeper lure right there. <laughs> Hover strolling. Woo wee. All right. How you do? <laughs> All right, guys and gals, smash that like button again if you guys get a chance. If you're just arriving here, we're covering lures tonight. We're talking about all kinds of different lures. We're going to cover them all. Uh, not all, but most of them, especially the ones that I'd be throwing this time of year. So we're going to cover everything that I think is pertinent for summer or at least late summer um, and fall. You know, in this, la you know, the, the last week or two before this leading up into, let's say, the next month going forward. So, um, all right. And again, you guys are always more than welcome to uh, let me know if you have any Sorry, guys, I'm texting a customer.
No, sorry, guys. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> I have uh, not snoring. No, no. I had a, a, a customer that was uh, reaching out to me regarding uh, an air conditioning quote. So I had to uh, get back to him real quick, you know, because trying to, to make work, right? So hopefully I got a couple of installs I'll be doing next week. So make a little bit of money, keep myself afloat for another few months and Yay! <laughs> I can't wait to see the tax bill. Not. This little dude is going to be a perfect example of upgraded hooks on a little bait. <laughs> I'm going to show you guys something here. So smash that like button. Thanks for watching Common Sense Fishing. Uh, tonight, again, we're breaking down lures in depth, and we're going to really get into it. So a square bill is a square bill, right? Not really. So there's a lot of different ones. I've got a KVD Strike King square bill here, right? There is, in one of my other boxes, I actually have one of them really expensive, uh, the other type of square bills. I've had a couple different types. But in here, we've got three or four main ones we're going to show you. Here's an Ish Monroe, River to Sea, Biggie Papa square bill, right? This is Delta Crawl. <clears throat> okay. They look very similar. The body is similar. Everything is similar on them, except look at the difference in the bill. The body is a little bit fatter as well. So with an Ish Monroe square bill, you get this really nice wobble that is just awesome. The, 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 the shake, the vibration. A KVD square bill, on the other hand, seems to have, uh, the Strike King seems to have one of the most wobbles. It goes side to side violently. Now that one, the KVD, so a Strike King, these are actually really great lures, and they're cheap, three to five bucks. They're really great lures for the Delta and Ponds. Now these Ish Monroe, they have a little bit of a tighter wobble than a Strike King. So they can also be used in dirty water because they also have a very wide wobble. They have a very big uh, swim pattern. When they swim, they kick a lot of water, just like the KVDs. But the KVDs, for some reason, kick, seem to kick a little bit more. Um, and... I think that they, I think, you know, there's a time and a place for each lure, right? But uh, I would go with a uh, with an Ish Monroe every day. Look at the hooks that come stock on these two lures, right? So let's get them to stop moving. And let's, let's look at these hooks. I don't know if you could tell. Hold on. Oh, man. This one is garbage. Tiny hook. This one is real thin and tiny, and this one's real thick and big. And these hooks are a lot better quality. Uh, so I would use an Ish Monroe over the KVD in almost any circumstances, stock-wise. Now, in muddy or mucky water, I might go with a KVD or a Strike King. And also, just for value, they're cheap. They don't cost a lot. And... Uh, you break a big one off, though, and one of these hooks snap, you're going to be pissed at yourself that you didn't have a, a Mondo hook, right, compared to these little dinky hooks. Now, you also have the Rebel square bill. This is like a Norman. This has a lot of kick to it. This has a, a, a nice wobble. It's a short little, like a bomber, right? It's a, the, the rattle, too, is important to listen to the thump 
I like the Ish Monroe usually has a, a deeper thump. This is a little bit louder. This will pull fish to you really good, though, and will catch big ones. So there's a couple of different types, right? Now, last but not least, this is not a square bill, but they make them like this. So there are square bills like this that are really thin-bodied square bills, right? And this is a Rapala. Do you see how thin the body is? This one, it reels. It has a very tight vibration, right? It don't go like this. It doesn't, it doesn't move like that. It just goes, so it has a very tight wobble. So two different things. You want a tighter wobble in clearer water, and you want a tighter wobble in colder water. So uh, a Rapala, they do make Rapala square bills, and also some that are silent, right? A wooden one, balsa, that don't have rattles and stuff in them. Those are excellent in the winter. So right now, obviously, at the winter, but I'm telling you, there's a time and a place for each square bill. Again, this isn't a square bill, but I wanted to talk about this. This is a just, just past a square bill. So here's a square bill, and here's this. So this is a bigger square bill. Let's get a smaller square bill out. The, this is the smalls, 1.5. Same body, but this is a square bill, and this is <laughs> the XPS. Now, this will dive down about 8 feet, maybe 10 feet at the most. I think it's like 6 to 8 feet. Might go a little bit deeper, I think up to 12. I'd have to double check. I forget which one this one is. But that guy right here, this dude is so killer for getting to depths that this guy cannot get to. And you can buy these that are like these. And that is right here. My dig is, is I would just like to customize and make a smaller one, right? These, I've got a double digit on this already. So I love this lure. But I'd also, for numbers and tournaments, would want a Ish Monroe River to Sea medium to slash deep diving that isn't the body isn't quite so big and there's one right here but uh, i think this is yeah same body size and this is you know remember how i was telling you this time of year i like to go crawdad or minnow you know fish color i tend to start shying away from this stuff i tend to stop you know, I, I tend to shy away from, I don't have one on me, but, uh, you know, I would use something like this as well. Even though it's kind of a blue gillish, it has that look, that, that minnow look. Uh, I probably would use that too even, but it's really see-through, holographic and clear. Barely has any paint on it. And this is a river to see. This is a biggie papa as well. So I think it's ghost minnow or I forget what color that one is. But anyways, there's there's a lot of different square bills. Oh, here's another one. Another type right here. So I think this is a rebel square bill right here as well. There's a lot of different types. And the bill on this one. You guys notice... The angle of the bill, see the difference? So this one's going to work more like a wake bait, and it's going to be a shallow diver. This one's going to dive a little bit deeper. This one's going to pull itself like this. So what is this, a Rapala? I don't know which one this is. This might even be a wake bait. I might be confused. <laughs> I think that is my wake bait. Let's see. I think so. Cause I think the square bill, I have a square bill with a different type of bill. Um, it's in another box. I got so many square bills. So anyways, square bills, remember, there's multiple different brands, but look at the body. Look at the look at the way that it's gonna wobble through the water. So if you're fishing dirty water, you want something 
with, in my opinion, a wider wobble. You want something with maybe a fatter body. And look at the bill design. You know, you might want something with maybe a wider bill, something that deflects more water. Um, if you're fishing in clear water, you need to find something that's got a tight, uh, a tighter wobble, especially as the water cools and as we start going from fall and into winter. You can still crankbait. You're just going to need to use <clears throat> a uh, tighter wobble lure. So let's put this away. And that's why, folks, I usually stick with the Ishman Row. If I'm crankbaiting, most of the time the Ishman Row gets me by in almost all circumstances. But I love a Rapala for when I get out to like McClure. If I was going to be a Shasta, I want something with uh, tighter. I want a tighter wobble to that, less kick. All right, getting into our next category here. Let's smash a beer. How you guys doing tonight? Anybody have any fishing plans? Uh, this weekend coming up. How about this week? Anybody doing anything cool? Like I said, I'm going Friday. The rest of the week I got to work. Well, basically tomorrow. <laughs> I have to go to uh, Sacramento. Dang it. We're just going to pull these out and show them off. Show when I'd use what. But I would definitely, we'll start with this. We're gonna, we're talking jerk baits now. I would definitely throw these two at the California Delta, knowing very well that I can get bass or striper with these two. I like those colors for striper. Um, you know, the good old silver and red or white. <clears throat> they also catch bass as well. But I like to use when I'm throwing a jerk bait. The idea is I'm usually trying to mimic a shad or a bait fish, right? Usually, if you're throwing a jerk bait, a jerk bait doesn't <laughs> necessarily have the body of a bluegill, right? Or a jerk bait doesn't have the body of a crawdad. <laughs> now, does that mean a red jerk bait won't work or a pink jerk? Of course, I'm sure they will. Fish are stupid. But just if you want to up your chances of catching them, then what I do is I also recommend <coughs> that you match what you're trying to throw with what's naturally there. So, for example, what else in the water that's long and skinny like this looks like this, right? This is, this is like a little bait fish, like a little shad, you know, a little minnow, a baby bass, whatever. A hundred different little tiny fish could look like this. But... A bluegill is not going to look like that. A crappie is not going to look like that. A crawdad is not going to look like that. Now this, on the other hand, is a crawdad, right? And is in a similar size body. Believable to me, right? So, I, I mean, I've thrown that before. I've actually caught some fish. I have a couple of those. But uh, jerk baits. <clears throat> to me, are primarily trying to imitate some kind of bait fish that's darting and jerking and 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 uh, quickly moving through the water, right? It's not a uh, it's not a crawdad, you know, or something. So I like to use fish colored lure, uh, fish colored colors. Um, this is an off one that I might use like at Clear Lake. However, I'm going to tend to use something like this more around here. I think this one's a... This is the Fetch Minnow 108. This is what the... This is the... What is the... Yet the... Well, I forget the name, but it starts with a Y. It's got the little lip that moves. Never really been that fond of this jerk bait. The pointers and uh, the LVs, those have been so badass for me. So this has really been one of my key jerk baits to smash big fish with right here. I've caught a lot of five and six pound fish last year with it. But this year, not so much. I haven't thrown it much. 
Um, but boy, I actually got a lot of them with it this year too, just at the early part, you know, February, March, or sorry, January, February, March. I was just killing them with this stuff. Um, and then again, match the hatch. So these little jerk baits can be killer too. Again, this might be used in dirtier color water. I might use this at Clear Lake, uh, a couple other places. This little crankbait right here, uh, this little jerkbait slash crankbait is actually a crawdad color, and it's worked very good. But I've always had to keep it right up next to shore. Got some tiny little hooks, though, and I've lost some big fish on it. And I don't know if you guys have ever had this happen to you, right? This sucks. <clears throat> Expensive lures. You lose the back end of them. Oh, man. Might as well just toss this one. So I've had a lot of different jerk baits in here. But jerk baits, here, you got a spy bait right here. Um, here's a little, little sly little bastard right here, too. This one is a countdown. This one sinks. I like this little guy right here. This little dude right here, I'll throw, and you know what I'll catch with this? I ain't going to lie. I catch a lot of trout with this little fake trout-looking Rapala. They uh, sink, right? So when I'm at, like, Pedro, and I know they had a trout plant, and I'm launching the boat, I'll sit there with a spinning rod and zip that all around me, and, and I'll catch 10, 10, 12 trout and throw them back before I even start bass fishing. So jerk baits are going to be really key. To me, I think, remember, uh, match the hatch. So go after the size jerk bait that you want. Um, three of the main things I think I need to talk about about jerk baits are when to use suspended, when to use floating, and when to use a sinking. And so, or sorry, uh, yeah, floating. So when you use a jerk bait that's floating, meaning that if you stop jerking it and reeling it, it will actually float up. That to me has always been in a warmer time of year. You're going to want to use jerk baits like that uh, when the fish are a little more active and they're chasing stuff around. And that way it's like the fish is backing off and then it can jerk forward and then it can back off. And you can also work it around weeds and other things. And when you pull into things, so when, most of the time I'll rip it right through. But if you're in sticks or something, you can jerk it down. Say you hit some bushes or you hit some sticks or something, then stop. And let it float out kind of like the crankbait like i do with the square mill so <clears throat> jerk baits killer when to use a suspended jerk bait suspended jerk bait when it's in place to me is usually fall uh usually going to be early spring fall and some into the winter but at a certain point i like to use a sinking jerk bait in the winter time and uh, I've done okay with that and also in the summertime so there's a window in the summer and a window in the winter when I like to use a sinking jerk bait so I can get the jerk bait down far and jerk it and pop it all around and then reel it up to me and then jerk and even stop and then jerk it and pop it all around do some cool fun stuff with it so um, you'd be surprised what kind of action you could get into with the sinking jerk bait not a lot of people throw those Never hook nothing on the back hook. What are you going to throw on Friday? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> what am I going to throw on Friday? So when I head to the Delta on Friday, let's check the weather real quick here. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat>
All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have this uh, customer I'm texting and dealing with here. So I want to make sure I take care of business and take care of everything. So thank you guys for uh, understanding here. Now, uh, what am I going to use at the California Delta? First thing I'm going to do is let's check the weather, uh, what the wind and what the temperature is going to be. So California Delta, let's put Stockton, Stockton, Delta weather. It was 82 and the low is going to be 53. And then so Friday is going to be 89 and the low is going to be 58. Saturday's 92, the low 60. Sunday's 95, low 64. Monday 94, low 64. I would hope because we're on an upswing Friday by Friday. I'm hoping I can start to really reaction fish. But if not, I would assume sometime Saturday or Sunday, the weather should be, the barometric pressure is rising, temperature is low, it's colder at night by almost 10 degrees, and we're going to see a warm-up. It's not going to feel like much to us because it's going from 80-something to 90-something, but it's not going to be in the 100, so it's not brutal. But... Um, to them, they're going to really sense that. So I would assume with the with the cold front somewhat came in, they're probably, and they have been for me, slow. So everything has to be done a little slower, right? So you fish a little slower. You can still power fish, those jigs, crankbaits, whatever, just been real a little slower, get them down a little deeper. Um, drop shots been really working for fish, uh, stuff like that right now. But with this warm-up, I'm hoping then I can probably throw a little bit more top water. Um, and also, I'm, of course, going to throw a square bill crankbait. And uh, if I can't get them on the uh, square bill crankbait or top water, I have a spinner baits that I plan on throwing these, uh, these Indiana, these double Indianas or the tandem Indiana, and then also the double Colorado and a couple others with Kitex, and we're going to try that. If we don't get them on that, then I know not to fight it, and I'll go immediately back then to probably something like a Texas rig and a drop shot, and I'll know to be fishing out deeper. Also probably be using a deep diving crank out there. Sometimes this time of year I've got bass in the 3- to 5-pound range as deep as about 30 feet deep at the delta. I have not tried fishing deeper than about 8 feet, so... Um, it wouldn't hurt to pull off and then actually try fishing down deeper because when the striper come in and they can just seem to push the bass down and get out of their way, the striper just come through, just maul and shit. So, um, I don't know. It's felt like that. They've been a little bit weird and they've been more offshore lately than right up tucked onto the shore, you know, for daytime fishing. So I had like something between five and seven pounds easy get off it was on a crankbait but it was out and probably over 60 garlic coming in it was just fish coming in and just got murked so they haven't seen good to see you on tonight jeff oh goodness my connection is unstable oh man i forgot i switched my internet connection to be able to uh print some stuff on my computer so i need to when we're done here shoot i need to switch back over to my other connection uh might be you know hopefully you guys are having a good connection or seeing you know it's not all bad on your guys is in but uh anyways we'll fix that so if the connection's an issue it won't be next time <clears throat> but anyways we're talking about lures jeff giving out tips and tricks breaking down everything we can Letting everybody know what's going on and uh, having a good time. So how are you guys doing tonight? Smash that like button. Leave a comment. Let me know. What is your guys' plans? What are you guys going to get up to this week? I've still got some more uh, information to drop, some more stuff to go over. But uh, we're going to just take a little quick break from rambling about fishing here and uh, spend, spend a little bit of time 
just talking about personal stuff. How's it going? And you know what's going on with everybody? Let you guys know what's going on with me. So most of you guys already know my aunt passed away from COVID. So sometime in the next couple of weeks, you know, I've, I've got to pay. So somebody already helped uh, pay for the cremation. Now I got to pay for like the funeral services and a bunch of other stuff. So we're uh, we're getting there, but you know it is what it is. And uh, the dog's not doing too healthy. She's looking like it's getting close. So it's like, yeah, there's stuff on my plate, but at the same time, you know, like I'm just happy as heck to have my children, to have what I do in life. And I look around, there's so much chaos and craziness, and I'm just very grateful for this little piece of stability that I do have. You know what I mean? Um, and it would take me tooth and nail to etch it out myself, but I have, I have somewhat stability now because of my own income, you know, I work for myself and uh, I struggle, but you know what I mean? It's a good feeling at the end of the day. So life's crazy like that, but uh, I'm sure everybody has their own challenges out there. You know, that's the thing is no matter how rich or poor you are, no matter how fat or skinny, tall or short, we're all going to have issues. You know, they're we're all going to get kicked in the nuts once, at least in life. So everybody's going to know how it feels eventually. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we just keep on trucking. That's why I'm just – this is also cathartic and good time to come and hang out and relax with you guys and gals, talk fishing, talk lures, talk tips and tricks, crack jokes, make fun of myself, you know, in a fun way, make fun of everybody else. All of those Democrats. No, I can let uh, – <laughs> Yeah, try not to get political or BS here. I want to keep this a safe space for fishermen. <laughs> this is a this is a, a, a spot where we should all be able to get along and, and speak our mind about fishing, hunting, outdoors, our families, good times, stuff like that. You know, that way I don't want to ruin it. I'm going to be doing more stuff on my show, Common Sense Talks. Though I'm like. Um, I don't know. I want to spend some more time on that channel. It just it, it gets it's hard when you know like that channel's only got like 30, 40 subscribers. I got to do something maybe and uh, put a little bit of effort into that. But I don't want to lag on this side. So, but do expect members to. Uh, we're gonna have a video coming out, and it's just for you guys. So I'm gonna be breaking down a couple of the local lakes. And uh, we're going to be giving some more of my tips that I haven't shared tonight with you guys. So we've got a whiteboard video coming. I'm not going to release it to the public. So I know it'll probably only get 10, 20 views. you have only got a little over 20 members. So you, <laughs> you guys have to watch it five times each for it to even get 100 views or so, you know. But uh, we'll take that. We'll release that to you guys. We'll give you guys something special. Big thank you guys for being part of the channel. And I'm also thinking about doing like a Google Earth episode or showing you guys some of my shore spots and, uh, you know, showing you guys where you can go pick some bass, some catfish, some striper off, different type of fish, you know, different types of uh, areas where I've had luck in the past. I, I'm not going to take any responsibility for what is or isn't private property because most of what I'll be showing you guys is public, but I don't know if it's changed or if I thought it was public and it wasn't, but, you know, um, we'll, we'll probably do something where I, I show you guys on Google Earth or a map. We'll share the screen. We'll take you guys along on a <clears> – <throat> doesn't it? It relieves the stress. It just is a good way to relax, right? You made a good, you know, a good way of putting it, Gabriel. Is, uh, it's just a good stress reliever, isn't it? So it's like uh, fishing is like its own drug. It's a way of relaxing, of just de-stressing and letting the worries of the world just wash away for a few moments. And at nighttime even can be so beautiful with all the stars out and now it's quiet. And there's not a lot of boats out on the lake. Oh, man. How's it going? Keeping it real? It's all right. Better late than never. Smash the like button. Let me know how it's going, everybody. We got keeping it real in the house. But... Uh, 
Yeah, I was just letting everybody know. So if you guys want to go watch this later or whatever, tonight's video, basically I've been breaking down like every lure in the box. And we're going to go through some more as far as like not every lure, but the most important ones. And actually, I think we've really only done crankbaits and spinner baits and like and like some other stuff. But I'm going to get into uh, Senko's drop shot stuff next. We're going to talk about that. But uh, just wanted to do a little intermission. So, you know, we had a chance to communicate for a minute, see how everybody's doing. I'm going to smash another beer or two. And uh, we're going to get back into it. Earlier, I talked about my glass rod, my crankbait rod that I have, how I do believe that if you can afford it, I think quality really does matter. So, oh, floating flies in the winter. I'll do it in the winter and in the spring. Float flies coming up soon. It's going to be a killer lure. When people just start getting mercolated and they can't figure them out, floating flies about what's going to kill them big time. And it should start soon, too, as soon as the nights stay cold for a while. So probably another week or two, maybe a month. But float fly is a good cold weather technique. Um, but when they suspend in the fall and you can't get them other ways, it's also a crazy killer way. And I've invented a new way of doing it called, like, I guess a drift rig. So it's not really invented it. But I use a drift rig and I put a Kitec, that little 2.8 or 2.2, little tiny mini Kitec on the end. And like a drop shot hook, like the redneck float and fly, basically, right? Use that sucker, and uh, I get smashed at the lake. So I always catch at least one or two fish with my float and fly dry out the side of the boat with my two pole stamp, laughing with my float and fly just just chilling, following me around, and I'm just drop shot and jigging, crankbait, whatever. And sure enough, I look. Where the hell is my bobber? Bobber down, bobber down. I will run, got my pole, catch up, and boom. Yeah, yeah, float and fly. <clears throat> when I popped that two pounder, LOL. Oh, yeah. Yep. I was just like, oh, hey, float and fly. How you doing? <laughs> yep. Oh man, was I've seen some like two and a half, three pound bluegill come out of that freaking that uh that lake, dude. So it's crazy. It's funny, I don't notice any pictures online of anybody smashing too many five and six pound bass out of there since I've been gone. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. I think that lake could be tough though for sure. But I know that man, it gets tough in the summertime, but shoot, last year. I was wrecking them. I was catching 25 pound bags and 20 pound bags and five, four, five pound bass a day, minimum, easy. Uh, jerk baits. I was just killing it. I had a good time out of Kelsey. It taught me a lot. Kelsey taught me a lot of different techniques and it opened my, my perceptions into fishing different lures. And it also strengthened my fishing ability for fishing in weeds and cover. And my ability with pulling fish out and also learning uh, which lines seem to have the most uh, less forgiveness and snap easy and which ones seem to be the strongest with all 12. So I'd use like 12 pound tests and I started figuring out which brands were like lying or just didn't really have or maybe the other one was just extra strong. But uh, I found a few brands that I really like a floro. Anywhere from like eight to twelve pound test, but mostly ten and twelve out there. Uh, I really got a lot better with a bunch of different lures out there. Frog fishing, a lot of Kelsey's put me on a lot of different techniques. So that place is is it was, was valuable for what it was, but I feel that I got to a point where there's not much else I can learn from Kelsey, and that there's not much opportunity at a ten pound bass, which is why. I didn't. I didn't renew my. Uh, I didn't renew my my membership. Yeah, Kelsey Bass Ranch, Dustin. I used to have a membership out at the Kelsey Bass Ranch, and last year I was doing my toy drive, and that's where everybody wanted to go, you know. And they're like, "Oh, we'll pay." You know, people donate hundred, two hundred dollars. We go out to the Kelsey Bass Ranch, and then I'd go buy Christmas. It didn't cost me a lot of gas money, so. It was profitable, but when guys want to like go to the Delta or these lakes, it cost me 20 to get in and 80 in gas in the truck and 
20 in gas. I mean, I don't even make money. And that's not the idea, but the point would be is 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 that it, to at least break even to where the fishing trip, like I basically I take the money that I would have used and then I buy toys with it and someone else is just paying for our trip so that it's like break even because I would normally spend the money on the trip anyway, so why not put it to a good use? That's why I only charge 100 bucks a trip. Well, a guide will charge you 300 to 500 bucks per trip. I'm not a licensed guide, and that's not what this is about. It's about, like, toy drives, right? So anyways, I'd take people out to Kelsey, and we'd smash them. And I've caught them on so many different techniques there, but Kelsey is a very tough place to fish. <clears throat> yeah, it was like, well, I'll tell you what. It, it's The problem with Kelsey is the fish aren't as big as you would think there. There's not a lot of bass over five or six pounds at Kelsey. There's a lot of like two, three, and four pounders there. And the fishery is so small that it's just like if it's not managed very well, the eight to ten pound bass die. They get unhealthy. And then as they get caught, they die. And then each one that gets caught, it dies eventually, dang near, even if you release it right away. Those fish are just, once they get over five, six pounds, they look like skeletors. They're just not very healthy. And Kelsey also, I'll tell you this, I've gone in one day and caught over 100 fish. I've also had 25-pound days. But on my honor, I could, I took in very good people out there, and we struggled to catch three or four fish, five fish. Kelsey will beat your ass. It is not an easy place to fish. I can take nine out of ten times. If Kel I'd have to say eight out of no, okay, seven out of ten times realistically. If I took you to Kelsey and I did not tell you what to do, you wouldn't catch more than five fish, and they probably would not be like fun for you. It'd be a very struggle and stressful. But once you learn Kelsey and you like unlock how to fish it. It can be good to you, but it can still – you can fish that place for 10 years straight and go and have a day where you only catch three fish. And then one week later, catch 40 fish and be like, what the heck is going on? That place is so crazy like that. So it, you'll learn a lot. The fish get hook shy. There's 32 members that pound it. So I felt it wasn't worth the 2500 to renew. I had to pay 2500 for that first year. And then you know what is there's plenty of guys probably like you that felt like it's cheating. It's a bass pond. And that without having actually had a membership, it's very tough there. It's actually not the funnest place to fish. However, sometimes it is. It's legendary sometimes. But with that being said, it ain't 2500 bucks worth of legendary. So there's a fine line. Like if they were charging twelve hundred to sixteen hundred bucks, like they were way way back in the days, then of course I would have like twelve hundred bucks. That's a hundred bucks a month. I would have renewed. I would be a member all day for twelve hundred bucks uh, a year. But twenty five hundred, no, no, no. That's just not worth it. And then if you fish it too long, you stunt your growth. All you learn is Kelsey. All you get good at is Kelsey, and you you don't get good at at other you don't get diverse enough if you spend too much time there it can eat your skills up but on the flip side it can teach you so much so with that year that i spent i spent almost two years a year and a half at kelsey uh i lot i learned a lot and um i don't plan on getting a membership again but uh it's helped me tremendously with the delta so i plan on going out there and just smacking them yeah lake yosemite can be bomb and then it can be brutal like what the hell like you've seen pictures of the guys when they spawn and they're pulling five and seven pounders out of lake yosemite and then like you go at the other time of year and there's just like no fish anywhere you're like it's like a dead desert like you know what i mean like what the hell or, or trout if when they plant them with power bait or you catch trout with or carp with corn so Lake Yosemite is brutal, but it's got some mondos in it. But, uh, yeah, Kelsey's a trip, man, I tell you what. And then, you know what I noticed? 
okay, so I got this YouTube channel. I'm trying to grow it. I'm trying to, like, attract new people and be cool. I'm trying to, and, and I'm not trying to it like I know it all or check me out or I'm so special. It's just like, hey, have fun and, and let's fish, right? And uh, so I was thinking everybody was going to love these Kelsey videos. Dude, my Kelsey videos are all awesome, a lot of them. And they all have shitty views. Nobody wants to see it. It's like, as soon as they see his Kelsey Bass Ranch, they're like, wow. You know, Greg Blanchard, Nick the Informative, and other older videos of like, oh, it's Kelsey, oh, it's Kelsey. So that when they see like a regular YouTuber with a Kelsey video, they're like, oh, pfft, it's Kelsey. And if you're not holding a 10-pound bass, they don't even care. They think it should be stocked with 10-pounders, right? And so like, oh, I'm over here sitting thinking yeah kelsey is gonna help me grow my channel and hell no it's like kelsey might have hurt the channel if anything people seen it was kelsey and they're like oh yeah greg's cool i like him i respect him so uh but when those guys have gone to kelsey a lot of guys think of it like uh, it, kelsey gets notoriety so in a bad way too though so that when i upload a video about kelsey it's like <clears throat> Nobody wants to watch it. And it's like, man, it was a great video. But so I've just right now I've been focusing heavy on the Delta. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with there's a lot of drought going on. So the California West Coast, all these lakes on the West Coast are dead. Any lake, Nevada, Utah, uh, shoot, uh, you know, uh, Arizona, uh California, all the Central Valley, Northern, all the lakes are just dead. They're just drained completely almost. So one of the only places that still has a good amount of water in it that's fishable is the California Delta. And it's so huge and a lot of people fish it. So I'm trying to put my hand in the Delta ring for now just to, to dink around. But I also want to be known as an all-around, kind of like Greg Blanchard is, right? He goes and he has a Samuel Adams, and he drinks with his homies, and they get their kayaks, and they show a little bit of the adventure as well with fishing. Like my other video, like where we're at Garlic Brothers getting hammered and eating food, you know, having a good time, and then we go out and we catch fish. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna show more of the story side, more of the personal side of the fishing trip. You might catch a good – I might record a good conversation between two friends, right? It might play a minute of it. So um, there will be some different cool, fun stuff that I'm working on. I also plan on going to the Sierra Nevadas to try to, like, go after smallmouth next summer. You know, it's all coming to a close this year, but the droughts wrecked things. So, like, I'm just focusing on the Delta right now. But, yeah, Greg's a cool dude. I actually got to Kelsey, but he's just been super – the B and boats. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, folks. I'm going to skip to something real quick. Now, I'm going to give you guys what I consider to be one of my best. I don't have the other ones on me, so I'm going to explain them. But I'm going to give you guys my best drop shot tips, my, my best drop shot information. And uh, then we're going to kick it, hang out. I'm going to dust these beers. I've been lagging, babysitting. And uh, if you guys have any comments, jokes, crack them, anything, feel free. There's a comment section. Smash that like button. Thanks for watching. Give me just a brief second. We're going to get into some cool drop shot stuff. <sighs> All right. First with drop shot. Number one rule, start with the lightest weight possible most of the time. If the boat's moving and you're in the back of the boat and you need bottom contact, go with a heavier weight. Hey, I'm not human. Nice to see you on. Thanks, everybody who has been on, who's been watching. If you've been on and off, I appreciate everybody. Thanks for watching. Smash that like button. We're gonna uh, When you're done, if you want to go back and watch it, I think Tonight's video has been very informative to me to be honestly trying to give you guys some really cool tips and tricks that are actually 
like in depth how lures work and why certain lures are better than, than others and why I pick certain colors at certain times. There's a lot of information to try to cram into one video, so I'm bouncing a little bit, but I think tonight's video was uh, pretty good. Now, we're going to talk about drop shotting for a brief minute. One, number one, <clears throat> excuse me, start with the lightest weight possible. Number two, know the difference between the weights. You have a finesse long weight, you have a round weight, and you have some diamond and teardrop ones too. So you have a round. This is for rocks. Always remember that. This is for fishing in rocks so you don't get snagged as easy. This is for fishing in weed and sand. And you can fish it in rocks, but you're going to get snagged way more often with your weight. However, this is more of also a stealth, quiet, more or less noise, less uh, just profile, I would I would say. But a weight's a weight, so I'm not concerned. The way I'm looking at it is this is what I'll fish in weeds, fish at the delta with stuff like this. This is something that uh, I'll use in sand or something that's not too crazy rocky. Otherwise, I'm using something like this. I will find really quick, if I can, one of the diamond-shaped ones um, and show you guys. Here we go. These are also for rocks. See? It's like a little coffin, kind of shaped like a, like a top almost. All right? So know what the weights are for. Rocks, finesse weeds and sandy bottom right round one rocks and and craggly stuff the finesse one for weeds sticks open water finesse sand stuff like that right <clears throat> appreciate it thanks man so have you heard of anthony pascal he's the yosemite lake bass whisperer of course anthony's a good buddy of mine anski's tackle box uh me and him are yeah, pretty good dudes. Like, uh, he, he's a really cool dude. I've been to a lot of his little events. He's been to some of mine. He's been in some of my videos. Uh, he's a cool dude. So he's I bought baits from him. I support him wholeheartedly. Tug Addicts Facebook page. So go Tug Addicts if you want to go check their page out. I'm a moderator on their page. I've also got Bass Fishing Lovers. So uh, good little Facebook page there. We appreciate all the support. <clears throat> All right, so uh, Anski's a good dude. All right, so uh, when we, we talk um, weights, right, hooks, go with the smaller hook as possible, um, one that you're comfortable with. And I've got to give a shout-out to Ryan Cook and also to a couple other people for putting me on these, but they also gave us some for free. This is a small version, but these point these hooks have been really good at a, a drop shot, and uh, that's the spear point. So these spear point hooks have been really, really good. They're odd shaped, but they seem to lock the bass in really good, and the bass do not get off. So that has just been one heck of a killer hook. So we're going to break down some information, throw it at you real fast. Try to make as much get out there as possible. All right. So smallest weight possible, round weight rocks, long weight, weight finesse, weeds, sticks, stuff like that. But a drop shot don't belong in that unless you're throwing it weedless. And um, so then remember, uh, again, smallest weight possible unless you're fishing in the weed. If you're swimming your drop shot, you're barely ever going to get bit. Uh, second, play with the leader. Start with either uh, a super long leader and go two, three, four feet, and then whittle that thing down to as much as one or two inches, three inches. Try to figure out are you getting, and a good way to do that is real quick, when you throw it out and you start fishing, if you get bit in the first seconds or first few seconds of moving your bait, the fish were suspended and they followed your bait down, make your leader bigger. If you worked it and you worked it and you worked it and you worked it and halfway to the boat you got bit, the fish are on. Lower your leader down maybe. So just something to think about. Leader size is important. Line, use anywhere from six 
to 12 pound test. I do not recommend using four to be a show off. You could do it, whatever, but I recommend it. Even the most clearest, sparkling, crystal clear, reverse osmosis water, whatever, I still would only use maybe six and above. Six, eight, 10, and 12 are my go tos for drop shot. I'll use 12 pound tests at Clear Lake, the Delta. I'll use 10 pound and a minimum at the Delta at Clear Lake. I'll use six and eight at McC if I'm on a hot bite, I might use 10 if I know there's biggins down there. So hook size, a one knot or one. Um, I like to use uh, uh, what size in the spear point. I like to use about three different sizes. So it just depends on the size caliber of fish I think I'm after or that are down there that I'm catching or am I losing my fish. So I go with the one knot. I'll go with the one. I'll even go with like a, a two or even a two odd. I kind of stay in a window where I don't want my hooks too big. Um, unless if I do, then what I'll do is I'll power shot. So instead of using the drop shot, I'll actually put like a skip gap or something like that. And I'll drop shot on an actually big hook and I'll use my 12 pound test, but I'll still set it up drop shot. It's the same principle. I've drop shot big old five inch flukes before. I've drop shot. Here's another thing. Okay. Don't forget, you can drop shot a Kitek and bounce it around. And it's like swimming a Kitek down there, just like a swim bait. But bounce, you can move it so slow and perfect. Don't forget, you can also, if you're using 12 pound test, you can put two hooks on one line, two hooks and then a weight. And almost like a little mini A rig down there. Uh, don't forget also, play with the leader length. Long leader, short leader. Yep, drop shot is awesome, dude. I've caught an eight and a half pounder on the drop shot. Keeping it real there, it's got a 10. Got a lot of big fish on drop shot. I've caught a lot of numbers. Drop shots win tournaments. They come in handy when they need to be used, but I don't like them. I prefer other stuff, but I do. I, I love them actually, but I've lost a lot of giant fish on them. And also, I think sometimes I could have caught giant fish had I just been throwing a jig or something else. But that aside, drop shot is still one of my favorite lures. Now, we covered weight, hook, spear point, uh, one, one aught, a two, maybe a two aught. In a, in a certain range, I'd swing around with, if I even go down as low as just a regular, a three, not a three aught, but a three, a small hook. I've used really small. But I, it gets uncomfortable. My friend Jeremy's used little tiny trout hooks before. I don't like that. I like to stay at a certain size. I want to be able to, the way I like to think of it is, the thick as the bass's lip is, that's how big I want the gap between the, because I want the hook to be able to go all the way and then penetrate. I don't want it to like, I don't want it stuck inside the mouth, hanging on by skin. I want it to pull out and hit and hook. So I would need the hook to be big enough to fit over certain lips. So the gap alone has got to be big enough. <clears throat> Power fishing is way more fun, but I drop shot when I have to. So remember, play with your leader length. Play with your weight size, weight type to dial it in. Remember, round for rocky, finesse for like the delta, weeds, uh, or just finesse if there's really bite. Uh, that difference might make the difference between getting bit or not, going from the round to the finesse weight. Secondly, uh, don't forget you can drop shot big stuff. You can drop shot crawdad lures. You can drop shot brush hogs. I've got a video. You go back and look some of my first videos in my new boat. I was whacking three-pound bass out of Lake McClure, drop shot in a baby brush hog in 60 feet of water, murking them. Um, I drop shot, like I said, rage craws and crawdads and killed them, creature baits. So if I think they're on crawdads, I can do that. And it's like a finesse jig on crack. Like it's just, it's you can't touch it. So don't think you have to drop shot a worm or a fish imitation. You can drop shot a crank or a crank bait. You can drop shot a crank bait. I just said that. You can drop shot a crawdad. You can drop shot a creature bait. So that's what I was meaning to say. Um, wacky rig, drop shot, wacky rig, drop shot, a wacky rig, Senko, drop shot, a wacky rig, wo robo worm. You can even, uh, 
uh, do some combinations where you do like a drop shot, almost a Nico. You put a little nail weight in one side, and then it, that way you can hold, say you use a two-foot leader, right, and you hold your line tight, and then when you let go, your, your stuff drops. Woo, poof, and then you can pull it back up and dance it around like a drop shot, and then poof, make it fall like a Nico instead of go real slow, right? Like if you lower your tip and you let your bait start to die. Some all kinds of cool stuff with the drop shot. There's so many tips and tricks. I wish I could just cram into one. Like it's, it's so hard. I could make a one whole video about it and you still wouldn't even believe the wonders that you could do with the drop shot. If you change the applications, you can power shot. You can drop shot on a bait caster with 20 pound line. Just you, know, you might be using a half ounce weight. You might be using a, a, a three-odd hook and a giant swim bait and just dangling a giant swim bait three feet of water and have a Mondo just come and hit it and open hook and just, <clears throat> right, with a bait caster and all that. And, and so there's a lot of different ways you can use this thing. Um, and, again, the reason the drop shot is heavily used and invented is for finesse. So I want to talk about the, the two best drop shot lures. One is going to be a robo worm. Good old margarita mutilator, Aaron's Magic, Bold Bluegill, uh, Morning Dawn, all those awesome colors, right? The pinks and the purples, and then also the bluegillish, the purple browns and brown, brown greens. So those are wicked. Now, what can beat a robo worm? Well, when you're looking at finesse, when it's winter time, especially at like McClure and some other places, this, <coughs> they make this in different sizes. The baby little wee wee size, and they make a bigger four and a five, I think. This is the business right here. Drop shot in one of these is like using live bait. I swear to God. All right, thanks for joining, Gabriel. Appreciate it. Now you guys got to get up early. I actually got to get up at like four, three or four a.m. too. I got to drive to Roseville and Sacramento. I think I got to be there by seven. Means I got to leave here by five. So if I got to leave here by five, that means I have to be up by at least four because I take an hour to get ready. I'm a zombie in the morning. Got to take a shoot in the shower, you know. Got to drink a coffee and uh, drink water and then try to, try to figure something to eat. And then here I am, you know, out on the road. Do I need gas? <laughs> Anyways, thank you for watching, Gabriel. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. And, uh, you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't forget to subscribe if you guys aren't subscribed or you're new to the channel here. But, um, anyways, back to drop shot. That Berkeley Gulp, man. I can't speak enough good things about it. If you're really struggling to catch fish, I don't care what time of year it is, the Berkeley Gulp is the way to go. Yeah, the Berkeley Gulp, dude, really. Like, whether you believe me or not, like some people, right, I think they watch my show. I think some of my tips are very underrated, and some of them are like, everybody knows that already. But uh, we're going to show you another one for, for – uh, uh, we're going to show you one for Clear Lake that a guide put me on, all right? There's a time of year at Clear Lake when uh, uh, these little guys, they're, they're these little minnows in Clear Lake have spawned, and they're like in the millions. And they're like Berkeley Gulp, but it's got the little, it's a it's a little Kitek. It's a, it's a Berkeley Gulp and a Kitek crossed. And the color scheme is exactly what they got in uh, Clear Lake. It's not the hitch. What is it again? This is electric blue and chartreuse, but it's supposed to imitate one of the bait fish they got in Clear Lake. I forget which one it is. But these little dudes are my, like, Berkeley Gulp backup. These things, to eight, eight bucks for a little pack of these things. They are so badass. Now, if it's also ultra finesse and you're fishing clear water, then remember those pinks are key, but these kind of colors are also super important. Now, I want you to notice something. Look at this. Do you see this bag here? Well, look what it is. Look 
my fingers just handling this bag. That is fish attractant. So almost all of my bait that I'm when I really need it, it stays soaked. I don't get my bang canister out and start spraying while I'm out fishing. All my stuff is pre-banged in a bag already. And uh, so this is some Cam's custom bait, little pink. These guys work great. And here is one of the king. This guy right here, if pink is not working, if these colors, if the pink and ro if margarita mutilator, if, if all the pinks and purples, and you swear, man, I always get them on that. Bold bluegill. Any time of day, this right here will bow, put a whooping down. This right here is especially good in uh, spawn when the bass are on their beds and they don't they don't want to hit something. And it's a that, that's a bluegill color. Oh, it pisses them off so bad. So I let the cat out the bag with the Berkeley Gulp. Please believe that is a true, really important tip. That if you're struggling to catch fish, dude, and you're a tournament angler, your five will come in the live well for sure doing that. So, um, oh, one other thing. I'll close this up. You'll notice I've also, as a little secret weapon here, I like to drop shot these. So, let's uh, let's give you guys let's give you guys some of my best little hidden tip. Then I find these little dudes. These little simple three and four inch curly tail the long ass ones with like green pumpkin with like some uh well, this isn't quite that that'd be more of this and then these little like mini stick baits like anski tackle box type stuff i drop shot this little stuff and i drop shot this too and they work so killer a lot of greens have been working for me this year too so um, another type I've been using, where's that, is these, they're like little Cinco's, right, it's like a little Cinco, but with the boot tail, dude, these are killer right here, <laughs> throw those on your drop shot, and then, if you really want to get finesse, shout out to Anski Tackle Box, right? Anthony Pascal, we were just talking about him earlier. Look at these little guys. <laughs> I'll catch trout, I'll catch bluegill, crappie, and bass with these. Drop shotting them. This is all drop shot tips. You can throw even, you know what? I've thrown these on Ned Rigs. <laughs> Yeah, I Ned rig weird stuff. I drop shot weird stuff. I like I said, I drop shotted big old, you know, five inch swim baits down there. You know, I've I've drop shotted uh, creature baits and crawdad baits, Ned Ned rig baits. I've drop shotted everything you could drop shot. Eight inch worms, six seven inch worms, sinkos, wacky rig, non wacky rig, and a little tip that I. The three of them that are sleeper tips. You keep your ears open here if you guys are in the drop shot. Is more than one hook on the line, like a Saduki or whatever it's called rig, right? Where you have two hooks or three hooks even. Just the more hooks you have, the less integrity your line has. You better be fishing more in open water and uh, your drag set. And um, with that being said, the other one is is going to be is gonna put you on some uh oops. kicking my wife my wi-fi signal going bad uh -oh. better not kick the thing back there what rigs would you use with a gulp minnow with a gulp the, the berkeley gulp is meant in any way in, in most ways to be the most realistic lifelike feeling, tasting, smelling, little bait minnow I've ever seen in my life. 
the Berkeley gulp hands down has uh, everything a bass could ever want or fish could ever want as far as looking like a real has a, has the the best motion and movement and it's also got the 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 taste and smell it is just saturated in a uh, you're like max headroom <clears throat> Nah, that's cool that he hooked you up, bro. Hey, hey, Marco. Nice to see you on tonight. <clears throat> oh, and the other one. Drop shot in the Nico rig. That's a that's a and, and drop shotting wacky rig. Those are two sleepers. One is drop shot wacky rig, right? Then you can also drop shot wacky rig and then take and put a nail weight. A small nail weight, not a heavy one like a normal Nico. We use a light nail weight just to simply make it fall down like a Ned rig. So you pop it up, and you're going to use it like a drop shot floating around and let it fall and pop it up. But then when, as soon as you give it slack and it falls, it's going to go straight down, boom, like a Ned rig or a Nico rig would. Try that little trick out next time. Let me know how you do. But, yeah, there's a lot of things I haven't really done videos on yet. It's hard, too, you know, and then you get stuck in your ways. Like, I get stuck throwing a square builder. I get stuck throwing this or that. I forget to share with you guys all the hundred thousands of ways I've caught fish over the years. I've done it a lot of different fun ways. But, uh, you know, we'll take you guys along for the ride. I'll remember here and there. Oh, yeah, I did a video, you know, where I did uh, two hooks, and I did one where I had the Ned rig on the bottom and a drop shot on top, and uh, we caught we caught fish. When one cast, it was on the Ned rig on the bottom. Next cast, it was on the drop shot on top. So it was, like, you know, pretty cool. I like to show that my fancy little weird things work, you know. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll try to do some more videos out on the lake tying these tips and tricks in like hey you remember on my live stream you know check this out so anyways it is 8 56 my how i rambled and i still had two taco boxes to go through i had uh another box of square bills and then i had these really quick before we go and you know, we talk uh any personal stuff or anything else like that i want to say how important it is they remember that when you frog fish, you do not always need to use a hollow body frog. You don't always need to use a this or that. You can throw a rubber frog that you can reel over weeds and all kinds of stuff. And these little tails will blah, 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 kick up all kinds of water like a buzz bait. Then you can stop and let the thing slowly sink. And you'll get it using it like a Cinco, and that, like a weightless Cinco, and then pop it. So you can actually stop this lure. You can uh, you can do so much with these uh, rubber frogs. And one I would greatly recommend that you look into are two specific ones, okay? The Rage Shad, which is a circular fish that the tail you break off and, and, you, and you use it weightless, and it's heavy and you can cast it real far, and it just blah, 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 blah tears the water up like a whopper plopper but then you can stop it and it'll slowly sink and then you can reel it even almost like a spinner baiter so it comes up and then and you can use it through anything and everything weeds sticks there's no and then unlike a hollow body frog when the fish eat this they eat this they eat it like they eat a cinco they think it's real there ain't no like oh, they don't spit this shit out and then like a unlike a hollow body frog, you got one monster and savage hook you can put right through them with a nice hook set. Oh, you know, while sometimes those hollow body frogs will, you know, not compress right, you won't get the hooks in them. I don't know. I just think that a lot of people sleep on a good old soft plastic top water, and because I, I don't want to just say frog, you literally there's rage shad, rage frog. They make the rage crawl even, but any rubber that is buoyant enough, big enough, and then the tail is designed right, it'll kick and splash like a whopper plopper. And you can throw them in trees down near, and you can throw them in bushes, and you can throw them in weeds and all kinds of stuff and haul your fish out. You can go straight braid, you know, but a lot of cool stuff you can do with that. So, yep, a lot of cool stuff. 
Yeah, I do the uh, I do toy drives. So if you look right here, Dustin, I take people on fishing trips. They donate money, and then I buy toys for kids. And at Christmas time, I'm going to take care of positivity out of it, and we'll grow. But that's not the way in 2006, and ever since then, every other year or so that I could afford it, I've done toy drives, and I've always given back. But Ever since I got my bass boat and I've had my YouTube channel, I figured, why not try to make it even bigger and better? Why not, you know, so to speak, kill two birds with one stoner? You know, why not Why not uh, do it efficiently? That's what I was thinking. So I recorded it last year. Um, there's like 15 or 20 toy drive fishing trips that were recorded. And at the end... Um, I culminated it all in, in, into a video where we gave out all the toys and got to meet a bunch of families. You got to see us at the Salvation Army. And uh, we helped over 200 kids last year. So it was pretty cool. It's kind of sad. You know, I don't want to beat on this thing because I love my community. So to everybody watching this, it this does not go to you. But it's kind of sad that when, like, like – uh, you got a guy out here genuinely giving good advice, got multiple double digits. I've got one, two freaking double digits on video and also does great stuff for the community and just people just don't seem to care. Like, you know, and I, again, I don't do this for the clicks or for the views. So I really doesn't care, but it kind of bothers me just somewhat inside. Not that I don't get the clicks or views, but that people in general just don't seem to care about positive stories and good things. People watch like a cat farting go viral or watch a stupid TikTok video of some hot chick doing something dumb or the stupid ice bucket challenge. But when you got a guy helping 200 kids, like nobody gives a shit. And it's like, I don't mean nobody because you guys do, right? And a lot of other people have. But it's just like the internet. I don't know. It just it's like yeah. That's why it's good. I don't even like to think on it like that. I just like yeah. I just ignore it and just do me. But it's crazy, you know, how YouTube's algorithm works. It's like, you know, you got a video of a guy doing this, and then a video, and then this one just. Eh. But either way, at the end, you know, you can't cry about it. Like things will go viral. It'll go viral. And things that won't won't. It's like. I don't do this like shock content. I never go setting up videos too. Like I hate that kind of crap where you see someone giving like a homeless person money. There's like heart wrenching music playing and they're like trying to get clicks or something. Like I've straight kicked doors in, you know, when houses were on fire and I've like saved a dude that was in the Delta after he crashed. I've caught all kinds of crazy shit on video. The, the, the raccoon with the hook in its face. So, but I don't set that stuff up. So naturally, it's going to happen or it won't. But uh, I'm grudgingly, I'm like, what do you call it? I'm uh, super stubborn, so I'm not going to give in. I just keep doing me, hoping that the channel will grow. And uh, I, like I said, I get paid. Like, I'm monetized, but I make like 70 to 80 bucks a month. So at the end of the day, I might make 800, 900 bucks a year doing YouTube right now, my first year. So it ain't, it ain't nothing, but it would be cool if it grows uh, one day to be something. But uh, the main thing is, is I just enjoy hanging out with you guys. This is, you know how we talk about fishing being like uh, relaxing and a stress relaxer. And you're able to get out and you're able to fish and relax. Having these live streams is kind of like that for me. I get to hang out with a cool group of people, share information, chat, have a good time. We crack jokes. And... Uh, this is just a, a great forum of good people that, you know, try to help each other learn and get better at fishing. And uh, I appreciate everybody for, for what they do, their comments, for being part of the channel. So it's just, hey, that's how life rolls, you know. Got to deal with it. You know, you got to deal with the punches. But uh, when there's always good times after the bad, you know that. What's a good amount to donate to get out and fish? The minimum I ask for is 100 uh, I don't care if you do more, though. I don't ever ask for any. I just say the minimum is 100 because a fishing trip costs me basically 100 bucks, no matter where I go. If I go close or I go far, it's about 100 bucks. Stupid truck to tow the boat, you know. 
even if it doesn't eat that much gas, depending on if I go to a local lake or a far one. I mean, at the end of the day, buy myself water and some beef jerky to eat and lunch or something is a hundred bucks. So the way I look at it is if, if I wasn't doing any of this toy drive, every time I go fishing, I'm spending a hundred bucks, right? So if I go fishing 10 times in one month, I spent $1,000 on fishing. So if I can go 10 times with people then they give me the hundred then basically it means i didn't make any money so i didn't make anything but then i'll take the money right that i would have spent because i basically you know now i have a thousand bucks that i wouldn't have normally had because i would have had to spend it on gas and food and beer and this and that so then i go and i buy the toys or i literally save the people's money and i put it aside and i buy toys and in some instances people have actually came and donated toys instead of money which is fine with me too if you like show up with bags of toys like hell yeah that's cool um so i appreciate every little bit that helps you know for the toy drive you know helping little kids out there's not a better thing in life you can do than to help others because i honestly think when you help others you help yourself there's just this innate good feeling about helping people, you know, it just makes me feel better inside. <coughs> oh yeah, I appreciate you guys. Let's read the comments, man. Uh Dustin Spence, I'm Sam Matthews on Facebook. So I'm uh I'm on um Tug Addict's Facebook page. I'm Anthony Pascal's friend. I have a bass fishing lovers, so you can get a hold of me through Facebook. My name's Sambo or uh, Samuel Matthews. You know, you can message me. You can get a hold of me, friend request me, whatever. Then there's also Instagram, Sambo underscore two o nine, Sambo two o nine. So you can send me messages through that. And uh, in my um, on the main channel, you have to go dig for it. But my email address is also public and available too. So there's a bunch of different ways. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Raucho. I'm I'm not getting off just yet. We're gonna kind of close this one out like uh, for 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll get off. I know it's kind of late, but I had a I had a, a a bunch of tips and tricks to get off. And next thing I know, I look up and it's already time to go, and I don't feel ready quite yet. I don't know. Uh, how about you guys? You guys cool with hanging out for another 10 minutes? Let's uh, read your guys' comments, respond, and then if you guys got any questions, anything you want to say, um, you know, appreciate it. Smash that like button. All right, so you got a good one. Enjoy watching your videos. I'm moving this weekend, so I'm packing up my fishing stuff. How long can a friend leave a pool at your house before it becomes yours? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't ever touch nobody else's fishing stuff except for a lure. If you leave a lure, I'm throwing it. If I lose it, my bad. But I ain't touching your pole or reel, though, even in a joking way because I'm a buffoon. And I tell you what, like, I get out there and trip over something and snap it in half or do something and break your eye or your reel and be like, ooh. At least if it's my gear and I broke it myself, I don't feel too bad. All right, I got that, Dustin. Let me accept that real quick here. My help. Let me go over here. Then if you're ever interested in going on a fishing trip, donating, just hanging out, I'm super easy going. Most of the guys on the channel have fished with me already. I fished with Charles Chalk. I fished with Hella Fino. I fished with Keeping It Real, Old Dirty Bassin, Mark Nav, <laughs> a bunch of the friends. Uh, Oh, why is my Facebook page not loading? That stupid thing. I'll, I'll accept your friend request here. Maybe we'll do it on my phone. I've gone fishing with most of you guys, <laughs> and I don't mind it. You guys are cool. Been a good time. There we go. Bam. Just accepted it, buddy. So, all right. Let me put this off to the side. All right, all right. Nice. I'm right in Winton, so I'm right around the corner. I've grown up in Merced. You know, I'm from Monterey and uh, lived there till I was almost like maybe between eight and ten. I forget. I think it was eight or nine. 
and then uh, moved here, and I've been in Merced most of my life. Now I'm in Winton because I own my house. And so when I had to buy and I had a, a, I was pre-approved for a certain amount, this was the best bang for the buck that I could get. <sighs> oh, yeah, they didn't, but they, they had, they got to hold one. And it was 9.96, but it was a double digit with the with the. Here's what happened on their video. Cool guys fishing with Magula, which is uh, Thomas Rosales. He's a cool dude. I like his channel. I like his videos. I fished with him a couple of times. He's actually a very positive, nice person, and uh, fish with Mark Nav a bunch. He's a cool dude, but uh, him and Thomas were at so Mark Nav. And Thomas Rosales are fishing with Magda. They were at Rancho Seco, and they came across a double digit floating in the water, like dead, dying, like splashing around. And they caught their attention, and they drove up to it. And when they pull up to it, it had like a one and a half pound crappie stuck in its mouth, and it was it was dying from it. And they got the bass, and they got the crappie out of the mouth, and they weighed the bass. And then they tried to save it. I don't think they saved it because I think at the end of the day, like you can see the fish like arm move a couple times, like you know it was alive. But this fish was like done, like it was dead down there. And and they tried to revive it. You can tell they were trying to revive it, and then it looked like it it didn't want to revive. And the video cuts out, so you don't know whether it lives or dies or not. But uh, they weighed it. It was just under 10 pounds. I'm not trying to hate or anything. I'm just explaining because I watched the video. Like, I support all my buddies. If you guys have YouTube channels, I'll come in. I'll drop likes. I'll drop comments. I'll support your channels. Um, I can't always remember to watch everybody's videos because, honestly, like, I'm stuck on YouTube watching. I'm watching, like, political crap or news or com comedy. Like, I love watching comedy shows and dudes are just roasting people. I'm watching podcasts like Tim Pool or watching Joe Rogan or whoever. I'm watching just random crap. So when when I when I'm gonna go fishing, sometimes I watch fishing stuff. Greg Blanchard's cool, but uh, when I go for information, honestly, I go after tactical bassin and Millican fishing, even Lake Fork guys and stuff like that. They're the three most informative. YouTubers, I think, other than or foremost informative YouTubers, I think, other than me, um, and I'm, that's just, of course, I'm I'm uh, biased on my own because I think I genuinely give out a lot of information and I give out my best information. Do I have an audience of X amount of hundreds of thousands of people that are doing it? No, I try to help those who are watching, right? But I think Milliken, I think Mikey Balls fishing, I think uh, fish the moment. And Tactical Bastin are the four best dudes on, on YouTube right now. I think Greg Blatcher is uh, just a really decent, good fisherman. I think he's excellent in a kayak, and he's a, a great fisherman. I've never fished with the guy. I don't know. But, like, he still seems like he's learning. Kind of like me, too. Like, we're all learning. But the guys that I go to that I actually think they have a lot of the based knowledge would be Tactical Bastin, uh Mikey Balls and uh, Milliken and Fish the Moment is really underrated. That little kid, dude, his channel isn't quite as blown up as like Tactical and the other guys like Milliken, but Fish the Moment's a little mini pro. He's he's smart. He's just super young, um, and he's not Guggen or any of them fools. Notice I don't name the Guggen squad. I got something against. Okay, if you're this way, please. I don't got nothing against you personally. But I was I was poor, I was homeless, and a lot of my childhood, just ever a lot of people had stuff that I didn't have. So there's a little bit of jealousy. So when so when you take somebody that 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 when I see someone who mom and dad had a big rich house and big rich money and they can and right out of high school you're going to Texas A and M with your big lifted truck and you got a bass boat in high school and you're fancy and you're well off. I got nothing against you, but I respect you less than the guy who's fishing out of his kayak like Greg Blanchard. 
the guy that's struggling and trying and every obstacle that life can throw at him is getting thrown at him and he's overcoming them and he's succeeding and climbing to the top. I respect that guy than the guys that had everything handed to him, but yet they're still very good. Like you cannot deny talent, but to hell if I'm going to respect you on the same level. It's just an innate impossible negative thing about me. I don't know. I'm honest, right? I wear my heart on my sleeve. I tell you how it is. It doesn't mean, again, if you're well off, I got nothing. I, I want to be rich personally one day. I want to be well off. I want to give all of my, my kids the stuff I couldn't have, but I want to spoil them. But I'm just saying, when I see one guy here, one guy here, and I see this guy who starts down here at the bottom of the totem pole and busts his ass to get up here, and I watch this guy get handed everything, but then take a leap, and he's really good, and they're too good. I respect this guy more every time. I just, I just, the road, the journey, the battle that it took for that person to succeed versus, and, and I'm sure the person that got handed to him, right? They, they still had to like fish and gain that skill. But when you're 14, 16 years old, and mommy and daddy can buy you a sixty thousand dollar bass boat with fancy digital fish finders, you got a leg up on the dude who's fishing in a pond from shore his whole life. You know what I mean? So that's why I don't like Guggen Squad. Boom. That's my answer. So anyways. <clears throat> all right. Meet and greet in the future. For sure, dude. We got to chill. You guys are all, I'm cool with all you guys, man. Rich, poor, black, white, tall, skinny, fat, whatever. Man, I'm a, I'm a jovial, happy-go-lucky dude, honestly. So uh, when I go on my rants, hopefully don't let it that stop anybody. Um, I'm, I'm totally cool and easy going, so I just get opinionated sometimes. Don't mean I'm right either. I'll admit that, you know. Psh. So I just, you know, I, I, I say things the way I feel. It doesn't mean that I'm just, like, super diehard about stuff. We can all, at the end of the day, you can agree to disagree too. I don't care. It's just... Treat people happy and respect. It's just like I said. I, I that's why. Because sometimes people ask me why you don't like Guggen. Well, ugh. so anyways. <clears throat> All right. Let's see here. Let's read some comments and then we'll be. Have you seen realistic fishing? Good night, RC. Um, well, before you go, let's see this one. I will go ahead and show that. I had Sam in the hood at the taco truck. You speak the truth, brother. He a G. Hell yeah, taco trucks, the shite, man. I love me some taco truck, a good dog, two and two. If you know what a two and two is, two al pastor, two carne asada. That's the best sweet four tacos. You're full. It's not too little. It's not too much. Like even a skinny dude can usually put them down. Fat dude can put them down. You might have a bite or two left over that you couldn't handle. You might have finished them and, and could have ate one more, but it's like perfect. Two and two. <laughs> that is the most shot up intersection. Oh man, I could, I could, uh, I could believe it, dude. Taco trucks too, the old Roach Coach, and oh yeah. Are you talking about the one by my house? Oh, the one by my house. Someone died this weekend at. Yeah, for reals. I don't know if you're talking about yours, but yeah, my taco truck right across the street. There was a shooting. Dude got smoked. Two people. One dude got smoked, the other dude got injured real bad. I'm like, the Winton Park, yep. Oh, the Winton, okay, so my taco truck that I like to go to is the one on Santa Fe and Walnut, and there's two right next to each other. I like the one in the parking lot of the gas station. I don't know why it's their salsa and their meat's usually pretty good. The other taco truck, I'm just like, eh, it's hit or miss, but the one I took you to. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's crazy, dude, because just this weekend someone got killed at our taco truck here in Winton, brother. <laughs> like crazy. Like, wow. Yeah, small world, man. Yeah, you got to love it, though. Shit happens at the taco truck. Meet me at the taco truck. It's going down. <laughs> got to love it. But tacos are universal, though. Tabas not Tuesday. It'd be Taco Tuesday. 
Oh, I'm already getting hungry thinking about tacos. Look at that, folks. All right, we're going to get off here in a second. I know everybody probably late, want to go to bed. So I appreciate everybody hanging out. I'm open to ideas. If you guys want to come fish with me, most of you guys have already. If you're interested, all you got to do is reach out. I travel the state. I'll go up near Sacramento. I'll go down south a little bit as well. Um, so I don't mind. I like getting out and having a good time. And I'm, I need to go on trips to record videos anyway. So it's cool to take a subscriber fishing. It's always fun. Um, so I'm easy to get a hold of. Again, if you guys ever have any questions, tips, or stuff you want to talk about, you can all you can always message me. I'm super easy going uh, to an extent of what I can handle, right? You can Facebook message me if you want tips or tricks. Doesn't mean you're going to go slay them, but I'll give you some advice. And if you message me, I answer. So, um, you know, I try to be helpful. So, you know, I want this channel to be known as a as a as a good helpful place to get, really get some good information but always again I want to end with I want to always put a smile on your face also so if I need to remind you that yes I pissed on my wife <laughs> hopefully that made you smile if not always at least once in the night I've got to tell some kind of joke or story you know I want to make you smile I want to make you laugh I want to help share some great knowledge and information. as always cheers good times with good people. That's what life is all about. It's too damn short. So put a smile on your face, enjoy it, and don't be scared of Casper. That ghost ain't gonna get <clears throat> with the bear statue suck. You know it. <laughs> you know it, Dustin. That's the other that, that's my taco truck. I like the one in the gas station. Now you want to know who has really good tacos too? Is I think it's Los Gordos right there on Winton Way before the tracks on the right, where they have, like, every year they have, like, the Mexican, like, uh, carnival comes into town, and it's got the big old parking lot in the back, and they set up the tents and stuff, and they, uh, I don't think they ever pull any permits because they don't ever tell nobody. There's never any signs or anything, but if you know what you're looking for, there'll be mad cars in the parking lot, all the... And they'll see the tents set up. And that's cool. They have a good time. I go watch it every once in a while. I go have fun. I go have a great time. I've gone to the Mexican bars and danced to mariachi when there's nobody there that speaks English. Nobody. Well, the only one, I had a buddy with me. They're like, he speaks broken English, you know, Spanish, but like heavy accent, you know, like English. Like, I don't want to make fun of nobody, but I could like, you know, say a couple sentences. You'd be like, oh, that kind of English. Like, yeah. We go to the bar and dancing and having fun. I don't care, dude. So, anyways, <clears throat> have a good night, man. All right, everybody. We'll see you guys. I know we went late, so I just wanted to make sure we ended this on a on a on a chill note, not talking too much about fishing. We got that all up two hours out of the way. Uh, we'll see you guys on Friday. And uh, don't forget, I'm going to be fishing at the Delta with Virgil. So if I'm late. Either you'll see me late or you might see me early uh, on a live stream from the phone. So we're going to figure something out. Might even be two live streams. Might live stream from the Delta on the phone, yada, yada, have a great time. Then when we run out of the battery, turn around and then on my way home, I might redo the live stream and fill you in on anything you missed or how the trip went. So we'll figure it out. But Friday I will be fishing and I do not think I'll be back in time to sit at the desk and do the live stream from here. So we will figure it out. See you guys on the next one. And uh, thanks for watching. Have a good one. Tight lines, everybody.